This is Lee Rosenbaum, and we're here at the Fenimore Museum in Cooperstown, New York, with its president and CEO, Paul D'Ambrosio. Um, we are standing right here at the William Matthew Pryor exhibition. Uh, Paul, can you tell us a little about the exhibition and about the significance of this acquisition of the Fenimore, which you purchased in 2010? Sure. Uh, well, the exhibition is the first ever retrospective of William Matthew Pryor's life and work. And I've known of his work for the better part of my 30 years here because I started out, as you know, by cataloging folk portraits. And so um, when a couple of years ago I saw this piece uh, up for sale at Kino Auction, I couldn't believe it was popping up again. <laughs> and I uh, immediately went to the trustees because I knew we had to have it. We, had, we already have six or seven prior paintings mm. in the collection, and we've got this great folk art collection anyway, but what a capstone for the portrait collection. We managed to, to buy it. Uh, it needed some cleaning, but it was in very good shape, and you can see you know, how the colors have come out, the palette and everything. Uh, but what I, I loved about it is that it shows Pryor as just a 19-year-old, just a teenager, mm. early on in his career. Look how proud he is of, of his new profession, and look how it accomplished he is at painting this shade and shadow in the face, beautifully painted hair. It shows really how well he could paint. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things about Pryor's career and about the exhibition is that it shows um, even though he was accomplished in this manner, that he was so attuned to the business side of art making in the 19th century that he developed this simple flat style for the artisan class that he knew in, in East Boston mm -hmm. and painted thousands of these, as far as we know, I think about 1,500 portraits in his body of work. Huh. And so he had a key role in democratizing portraiture mm -hmm. in 19th century New England. Mm -hmm. And that's a really incredible contribution and one that deserves to be fleshed out in an exhibit and catalog. Yes, and uh, let's go and look at some of the, the various styles that he worked in. There, there were three okay. basic styles, and, uh, yes. and he, he tailored it for, uh, for his audience. Well, one of the things that, that we, we used to think is that he developed the flat style later in his career, but we find out that he, in fact, had it in his uh, repertoire early on. These are some early paintings from Maine. And you can see, again, how accomplished they are academically. If you look at the, the faces, uh, they're very, very uh, well articulated and three-dimensional, sculptural, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I think even early in his career, he was encountering sitters that could only pay so much for a portrait. And working in that style took a long time to do. So he developed a much more efficient style. This one we call his middling style, mm -hmm. somewhere between the flat style and the academic style. You can see it has less modeling, but to me, it has such beautiful brushwork, uh, such a fluid style to it, such life to it, and then it also has this element of pattern and design. Well, William Miller was the charismatic preacher who preached the end of the world uh, <laughs> in the 1840s with this complicated calculation based on biblical prophecy that the world was going to end and there would be the second coming in uh, 1844. He developed quite a following. Uh, we've had this portrait in our collection for many, many years. It's not conclusively identified as William Miller, but it does have some elements that are really key to, to linking it with Miller. The wide-brimmed hat, the book of uh, Voltaire, which he studied, and uh, the date of his death on the book, symbolic rings that we see, um, we see uh, him in his, preach, in his preaching talk about rings of fire in the sky, different types of using rings as a symbolism. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a number of people over the years tell us that they did not think that this was William Miller because if you look at how he actually looked in other portraits, it, it doesn't look exactly like him. And in fact, you have another portrait of him. We do have another portrait of him in right the gallery. Right over here. Yeah, and that one was done uh, during his lifetime and probably from life. And you can see it's got a broader face, yes. more prominent uh, forehead. Mm -hmm. Formidable man, but he looks like a you know, stern businessman in this <laughs> one. Um, but one of the things we know about Pryor is that he uh, advertised that he could paint portraits by spirit effect after somebody's death. 
this was done after Miller's death, mm -hmm. for sure. But, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, spirit effect aside, because he knew Miller, I think it's more of a symbolic portrait. I think he, in this painting, is showing the impact that Miller had on people that he met and preached to. I think these are two of the greatest paintings of their time, uh, let alone of this show. Uh, these are the lost sins that are at the Shelburne Museum collection, in the Shelburne Museum collection. Uh, Nancy Lawson's first cousin was a prominent Millerite preacher. Mm. So even though it's often assumed that Pryor's affinity for African Americans is based on his abolitionist leanings, we think that in fact it has more to do with the um, Millerites and their evangelization of the free black community in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. But the thing that strikes me about these two portraits, they are just the most beautifully painted, sympathetic and dignified images of African Americans in American art. And if you look at the faces, look how much life uh, is in that face. Uh, to me, that is, these are just some of his most accomplished images. They are done in that middling style. He's not, they're not academically painted, mm -hmm. but just the, the liveliness of the brush strokes. There's enough modeling in there, and there's that glow that you see in their faces that you don't see in a lot of his other faces. He must have just really, really liked this couple, mm -hmm. really wanted to paint them in this manner, and really felt it was important to do so, because as you noted, these are the only ones, I think, in the exhibition that have the signature right on the front, which even though you know, slavery is not in practice in the North, certainly not in, in Boston, this was still a brave act. Yes. And it certainly was a brave act to sign his name so prominently. That is, as you put it, that is a statement. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. And uh, this show will be traveling to New York for those who miss it in Cooperstown. It'll be at the American Folk Art Museum. That's correct. And uh, you clearly, this is your field, uh, your specialty, and you clearly have a great affinity for this. And, and thank you so much for taking us through. We enjoyed well, thank it. Thank you.